Welcome everyone uh, to this March 24th um, meeting of the Capitola City Council. Um, and um, I'm gonna have us begin with a roll call, please, Chloe. Thank you, Mayor Story. Council Member Bertrand. Present. Council Member Brooks. Here. Council Member Peterson. Present. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Here. Mayor Story. Here. And um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Vice Mayor Kaiser if she'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Um, and Chloe, maybe now we, you could uh, give us an announcement uh, preceding tonight's meeting. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. In accordance with California Senate Bill 361, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom or using a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on the published meeting agenda. The public can also stream the meeting live, watching on our website or on our YouTube channel. As always, the meeting is also cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Our technician this evening is Cedric. Thank you so much, Cedric, and thank you, Mayor Story. Yeah, thank you, Chloe, and uh, also my thanks to Cedric uh, for getting us on the air this evening. Um, and uh, next we'll go to additions and deletions to the agenda. Are there any? Staff has no changes this evening. All right, well, that will bring us to presentations. Uh, and tonight we have a presentation on uh, Mayor for a Day, um, a youth essay contest. Uh, who's going to present uh, on this for us? I, I will be, Mayor Story. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Thank you for this uh, recognition for the present presentation. I'm going to share my screen and make sure that everything is working. How does that look on the moderator's end? Looks great. Great. All right. So um, I'm going to present for you a um, Mayor for a Day, a youth essay contest. Uh, Recreation will be hosting this event at the request of council. And um, I'm here to provide you details as to how that um, is going to occur and um, an opportunity to answer any questions. So, uh, the city plans to offer this Mayor for a Day contest. Um, there has been research done in several other cities that have also provided um, similar events within their community. And um, this, it's, uh, this event is modeled after a lot of the successes that have occurred in other cities. Um, so there will be two divisions, an elementary school or an elementary level and a middle school level. Um, and youth who enter in the contest will be given a guiding prompt. Um, staff is open to suggestions as to what that prompt might be, but um, a pretty common one that was found in research is, would be that if you were a mayor for a day, what action would you take for your city? Um, so staff, upon the closing of the deadline for receiving the essays. So we will um, post on our website 
a portal where anybody that enters will be able to complete their information. Parents will um, sign a waiver as this is a youth contest and um, they will enter in their essay. Uh, the essay deadline will end and staff will review all of the entries and um, have the option to, we could make a selection uh, in which mayor or a council designee would select the ultimate winner from kind of the top five that are chosen in each division. Um, or staff can just review uh, whatever is the, the, the choice of the council. And um, the winners will get the, an opportunity to meet the mayor or designee and recognize at a council meeting. Um, the timeline for this event, we would be launching it in coordination with the beginning of school of next school year um, and communicating to the school district within the city as a way to again, get the word out that we're posting this and hopefully um, there will be teachers that will provide opportunities for students to engage either as part of their lesson or just as part of a communication that this is an opportunity. Ultimately, that essay deadline will be September 30th and um, staff will begin their review phase in order to provide um, with any selections to mayor or council designee. And then October 7th, the winners will be announced with the plan that the elementary contest winner would attend an October 13th meeting in order to be recognized for their accomplishments. And then the October 27th council meeting, we would have the middle school um, winner attend. Um, and then that pretty much is the conclusion of my presentation. Um, I am happy to answer any questions at this time. Council members have questions? Yeah, oh, um, yeah, Council Member Peterson. Thank you. Uh, it's not a question. I just wanted to thank staff for taking the time to put this together. This is something that I was really excited and hoping that we would be able to do as, as a means of, again, getting more young people in, engaged in our community, in our city. And so I'm really excited uh, to see this move forward. So thank you so much. Council Member Bertrand. So they'll get a plaque or a proclamation. I might have missed that if you mentioned it. Yeah, um, the various cities have done both of those as options for research. They've been given proclamations. They have been awarded certificates of an accomplishment um, at the actual council meeting that they are planned to attend. And we can work with council and city clerks for the appropriate recognition. And are we going to go through the official ceremony? Chloe would swear him in as mayor for the day. Um, I think it would be terribly cool from a kid's standpoint. I I think I we will see. I'll, I'll research if we can actually do something like that. Yeah, I went through something like this in San Francisco, and it's, it's really cool when you get recognized. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, it's official. <laughs> Any other Questions from council members? Um, yeah, council member Peterson, did you have your hand still up or? My apologies. Yep, just forgot to take it down. No, no, no problem. Um, and then, um, uh, Nikki, um, I did have a question. Uh, the prompt question um, is going to be um, if you were mayor, what action would you take for your city? Um, and I was just, since it seems this is limited to um, students in the SoCal Union Elementary School District, and I believe we're the only city within that school district, um, could it maybe uh, prompt them to say what would you uh, do for you, Capitola? Yeah, we could definitely include that. I think that's great feedback. Um, I did want to leave it open because I, I would imagine that there might be students that live in Capitola that attend private school um, or are homeschooled. And I'm hoping that we might get uh, 
uh, entries in from those students as well, but I do think that it makes a lot of sense that it would be Capitola instead of city. Okay, instead of, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking since it's, since it's just being kind of a generic city, uh, mm -hmm. maybe have them focus upon and learn more about Capitola. Um, so just my thoughts, um, and you can take it or leave it. I think it's, it's a great um, civic participation program for the students. Um, and I, I, I certainly um, look forward to reading the essays and hopefully if there's another council member that helps me, that wants to help me select a winner, or I would certainly uh, appreciate that assistance. But uh, I think we all look forward to hearing more about it as time goes on. So thank you. Um, let's see, the next item is additional material. Do we have any additional materials for this evening? Yes, Mayor Story, uh, we did receive four emails regarding item 8A, the flag request item. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, those will be uh, included for the record um, and which will bring us to uh, item five on the agenda for this evening, which is oral communication. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the public to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda or on our consent agenda. Um, and um, if you would like to speak, um, just uh, raise your Zoom prompt um, and um, you'll be recognized by our moderator. You'll have three minutes to speak uh, or you may dial star nine if you're on the phone. Um, or you may send an email to uh, public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Larry, do you notice if there's anyone that wishes to speak on uh, public comment? Mayor Story, I do not see any attendees with their hands raised, and we do not have any uh, emails regarding public comment. Okay. All right, going, going, gone. Then we'll move on now to uh, staff city council comments. Um, we'll begin with uh, are there staff comments? I think our public works director has one comment for you guys. A little update for you this evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I just wanted, if you may have noticed, we have a portion of Noble Gulch along Bay Avenue cordoned off with uh, some tape and some pylons. Unfortunately, we have developed a small sinkhole there. We will be starting to explore that next week. Uh, we're going to get a contract out to explore it, and we'll be giving you a report at the next council meeting if we need for the emergency action we need to take. So just wanted to give you a heads up on that. We will be putting orange fencing around it this weekend so nobody can get in there. Um, well, Steve, I just wanted to ask, is, is that... Um um, around the, the pipe that goes under the culverts or? So we did do an inspection of the large culvert there. It is not part of the large culvert. It is a drain line that comes off of Monterey Avenue and goes under the lawn there. And it's about in the middle of the lawn area uh, behind the sidewalk there. Okay. Um, does, does any other council members have uh, Questions on, on that? That is seeing none. We'll move on. Are there other staff comments? Seeing none, I'll um, go to council now. Uh, council member have comments? Um, yes, council member Peterson. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, take a quick moment to let my fellow council members know. Um, uh, earlier in the year, we became members of the National League of Cities as we were already a part of the California League of Cities. Uh, and I was recently considering uh, looking into what kind of events or educational opportunities that they had to provide. And I just wanted to share with you all that on Wednesday, April 6th at 9 a.m., the National League of Cities is having a new member orientation where they will share with the new uh, member cities kind of what they have to offer to us. So you can register for that uh, on their website and I will be participating and I hope you will consider it too if you are able. And that's all, thank you.
Um, any other comments? Um, yes, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. I just wanted to let everyone know that the Children's Network just recently met. Um, this is one of the groups that was put together many, many years ago by the county supervisors, and we're going to be looking at um, updating our bylaws and creating our action items for the 23 um, year. And so if there's anything that has been on any of your minds about what you're observing in the community in relation to supporting youth and, um, and kids in our community, um, just please let me know. Uh, I'd be more than happy to bring that to the table. Um, and also, I am planning to attend the League of Cities event coming up in May, that's May 11th through 13th, to um, discuss upcoming um, uh, bills that are being proposed and, and looking at policies that are being rev uh, revised at the governor's, uh, on the governor's desk. So just thought I'd give everyone an update on that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Council Member Brooks. Um, any other council members? Um, seeing none, um, I'll go ahead and um, uh, report out on the uh, Monterey uh, Air Board's uh, meeting last uh, Wednesday, March the 16th. And there was just one item um, that I wanted to bring to everyone's attention, and that is the, uh, this year's uh, AB 2766 grant um, process. You know, these are grants that come down from uh, auto fees, um, which are uh, given out to most of the local jurisdictions uh, for the purposes of reducing um, pollutants and uh, particulates in our air. Um, for example, you know, the, um, um, the electric uh, street sweeper uh, that we recently purchased uh, would be an eligible uh, project. Um, uh, assuming that the timing all goes right, but uh, just did want to report on that. Uh, the outreach uh, that the Air Board is going to do, um, well, they're going to be doing that soon uh, to all the local jurisdictions, um, and the deadline is, um, or the um, grant uh, is going to be um, opened on June the 7th. Um, so just wanted to make everybody aware of that. Um, also want to let you know that the uh, that the Arts Commission is uh, having its annual retreat. Um, I say annual, but we missed last year, so um, it's become biannual. But we're catching up. We're going to have our retreat this Saturday uh, to get together and talk about uh, strategic planning for the um, Arts uh, uh, Commission uh, for uh, for the coming year. Um, and then also the report out on the Finance Advisory Committee that met last Tuesday, which is on the 15th. Um, and they did uh, approve a recommendation uh, for the council to consider uh, a vacant housing tax um, in Capitola uh, for the upcoming November um, election. So uh, that may be coming uh, forth to us at some uh, future date. So that concludes my report. And um, with that, we'll move on now to the consent items. Um, these items will be handled with one vote unless um, any member of the council would like to pull an item for further discussion. Any requests to pull an item? Or any questions on the item? If not, is there a motion to approve? I can approve the motion. Okay. Is there a second? Motion by uh, Vice Mayor Kaiser. I'll second. And a second by Council Member Peterson. Um, with that, uh, can we have a roll call vote, please, Chloe? <clears throat> Council Member Bertrand. I approve. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. So the uh, consent calendar um, passes unanimously, which will now bring us to um, item eight, which is general government and our public hearings. 
Uh, the first item uh, for our consideration this evening is um, a request to um, consider a request to fly the um, thin blue line flag during National Police Week in accordance with policy B-18, our, that's our flag policy, outdoor display of governmental and non-governmental flags on city property. Um, the staff recommendation is to deny the request um, and I'll ask for a staff report on this agenda item. Thank you, Mayor Story. I'll be presenting, so let me get set up here. Okay, moderator, are we seeing everything correctly? Yes, it looks great. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Mayor Story. Yes, so I'll be presenting the flag request item this evening. A little background on uh, the timing. As you may recall, this item was on the agenda for last uh, meeting on March 12th, and council did, um, after being asked by the requester, approve postponing it to this evening um, in light of the Capitola Foundation meeting, which was on March 15th. So the Capitola Public Safety and Community Services Foundation held their meeting March 15th. The requester presented this flag request to them. There was a motion to recommend that City Council approve the request. The motion did fail. There was a six no and five yes vote. So that's kind of um, what's happened on the interim. The rest of the report is um, identical to what would have been given on March 12th. So a little background, uh, the current flag policy was approved by yourselves, um, council in May, 2021. And it does include section five non-governmental flags, which outlines the process for members of the public to request that the city fly a non-governmental flag here at City Hall in place of the state flag. On February 2nd, a member of the public did submit a formal request to fly the thin blue line flag uh, here at City Hall during National Police Week, which is this year is May 11th through 16th. National Police Week is an annual um, week that is designed to really honor and um, acknowledge the police force uh, throughout our country and their families and in particular honor those that may have been killed uh, doing their jobs to protect the community. So the flag in question is pictured here. It is a black and white representation of the American flag with the sixth line, uh, if you're counting, going up the flag um, in blue. And it was designed in 2014 by the company Thin Blue Line USA. And the, uh, the quote here is from that company explaining the imagery. So the black space above, um, I think you can see my mouse up above here, represents uh, chaos, uh, law and order, excuse me, peace, law and order. Then um, the space below the line, um, anarchy, chaos, crime, and the thin blue line here representing law enforcement, um, keeping crime from pervading society. So that is the explanation there. And a little more on the flag, kind of a pro and cons, if you will. Uh, supporters explain that it represents uh, support for law enforcement and is used as a sign of solidarity with the police. And other associations and some controversy around it are that the design itself may conflict with uh, the United States flag code, which is actually quite long <laughs> and interesting. Uh, but in this case, um, the flag code does state that the flag, um, the United States flag should not have any imagery, colors, letters, anything placed upon it. So it, it is not clear if this conflicts or doesn't conflict, but it is certainly something that has come up several times um, in researching this. Uh, for others, the mentality and the language, the thin blue line in general, can emphasize an us versus them mentality, which counters the idea of community policing, um, thinking of police very separate from those that they're sworn to protect rather than part of that community. And also the flag has been prominently displayed by extremist groups uh, in recent years, 
in particular at the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally in 2017, and more recently, last year, the January 6th insurrection. So all that being said, uh, this is not a judgment on the flag or those that support it or those that do not. It's more just pointing out that this controversy does exist. So with that being said, the recommendation uh, is to deny the request. And I am available for any questions. That is my report. Thank you, Council. Do council members have questions on the um, uh, presentation? Um, council Member Peterson. Thank you. Um, one of my original questions was going to be how the, um, what the recommendation of the Public Safety Foundation was. I previously sat on that board and I know that the a uh, person making the request to um, to fly this flag specifically asked us to, to postpone so that it could go to that um, body for a recommendation, but that was answered in the presentation so um, that they didn't recommend it. So uh, my other question would be, have our uh, POA or police chief weighed in on this? Have our local uh, law enforcement agencies uh, re requested this? Do they recommend it? Or is there anyone that could speak on that? did not receive any communication from them. I do know our chief is on the call. Uh, so that would be my response, um, if that answers your question. Yeah, uh, Chief Daly, are you available to respond to Council Member Peterson? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, uh, Mayor Story and Council Members. Um, I want to uh, thank you for allowing me to speak on this matter. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the applicant, uh, TJ, for recognizing the fine members of the police department and others in law enforcement. So thank you very much for that. Um, while I agree with some of the applicant's points, um, I, I, there are some in, this, in the community that find this, this flag offensive and divisive. Um, our city flagpole re represents the community. And as your chief of police, I want to be inclusive and, and really sensitive to all of all the community needs and concerns. I want everyone in our community to feel as if they'll be treated fairly by our police department. And this proposal could be counterproductive to my goal of ensuring the community feels protected and valued. I feel the presented uh, staff report really reflects the varying viewpoints. And uh, understanding that, I hope that uh, you, it'll give you enough information to really make an informed decision. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief Valley. Are there any other questions from council members? Um, you know, and if I may, um, you know, as I disclosed at our last meeting when we discussed this extension, I am a member of the Safety Foundation. Um, and to um, you know, let the council know that uh, that vote of 65 um, in opposition to the request um, I did not participate in that vote one way or the other. Um, and so I was one abstention and there was actually another abstention on that vote. So the full vote was actually five in favor, six opposed, and two abstention uh, on the question. So just to give you a full picture of what happened at the uh, Safety Foundation. Um, being no other questions from council members on the staff presentation. I think I'm gonna take it out to the public now. Um, and this is an opportunity for members of the public to address the council on this item. Um, if, um, if you'd like to speak, just raise your hand in the Zoom application. You'll have um, three minutes to speak, um, or you can dial star nine on your telephone. Um, and um, or you may also um, send an email uh, to us at um, public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Um, I see that we have one hand up. So Larry, if you could. Uh, um, yes, we have uh, TJ Welch. Uh, yeah, if you could uh, allow TJ to uh, address the council. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, we, we can hear you, TJ. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Mayor Story and City Council members and 
Um, I, you, I sent you folks a, uh, my, um, I guess, a uh, little back up to the city manager's denial of the staff report uh, and my response to that. And I think I went through uh, most of the issues, but I, given the fact that um, there's some information added tonight, I think I need to address those. But first and foremost, I think um, it needs to be stated that it's pretty clear that this flag is not uh, a desecration of the U.S. flag. Um, the American Legion who oversees that has, has not stated on that because of the black and white stripes, um, the design, it does not meet the intent of the U.S. flag, which has 13 alternating red, red and white stripes. So even PolitiFact, not a conservative organization by any means, has said this is false. So I'll lead off with that. And I have a whole other thing to write here, but I think I need to address a couple of things. I also used to be on the foundation. I was the president for two years. And during my tenure, uh, we were able to set up the Officer of the Year Award, which the city now does. We also bought rifles for our uh, Capitola uh, police officers who didn't, the city was not buying them at that time. So I, I think I spent some time going back with the police um, trying to support them. And that's what this was supposed to be, supporting our cops. It was never meant to be a political issue. Unfortunately, the city manager's office uh, made it this way. And, um, and there's a lot of issues out there. I guess I'll go right to the point and jump to the controversial part. Um, first, if we talk about January 6th, um, there was also the progressive flag prominently on display there. So you may want to revisit that policy if this is what you're basing uh, it being tied to right-wing extremists. I think most of our police officers would take offense to that since every police officer I know, even those in Capitola, have them on their vehicles or uh, display them. But I think it's unfortunate in our time uh, that we've made them feel like they can't even uh, be proud of who they are because of this uh, um, bias out there against our cops. It's not, it's not the cops uh, out there who are doing bad things that intimidate people from coming. It's activist groups who do not like our cops since uh, defund the police. So I see my time's running down. So I would just ask you to go back, review uh, what I wrote or uh, in the response and support our officers. Hey, I understand. Uh, I would also say that both the city manager and the police chief voted in that vote at the, um, uh, at the foundation. So the numbers could be different based on who was there. It was a, uh, uh, straw poll goes the way I look at it, but I will accept your outcome. And I think uh, whatever happens after that, um, you know, is what the city of Capitola will have to deal with on how you folks are. I was hoping we had some leaders here would stand up and support our cops uh, like you do other activist groups within the community. So thank you, and uh, I hope uh, you guys make a good decision. All right, thank you, TJ. Um, are there any other members of the public that would like to address the council on this um, item? Yes, Mayor Story, we have uh, Tyree Ritchie. Okay, go ahead. Um, Hello, can you folks hear me? Yes, Mr. Ritchie, we can hear you. Go ahead. Awesome, thank you for your time. I just wanted to speak out about this action item. Um, I heard about it this week. Uh, through a local community member who shared this with me. And um, as a black male who's uh, also a resident of Capitola, um, I'm deeply concerned about this issue, um, just given the uh, recent issues we've had around Santa Cruz County as a whole. Um, also given the recent Black Lives Matter mural being defaced and um, things being lingering with that. And also with issues of things like racism being addressed as a public health crisis. Um, I think it re uh, results through systemic policies when it relates to policing. And also as a black male, unfortunately, as Capitola resident, I have dealt with a lot of issues when it comes to policing. Um, given last year uh, during the pandemic, I was stopped and profiled by Capitola police um, over an incident that happened at the car wash. Uh, it was a gentleman who was a light-skinned Hispanic male burglarized the car wash, unfortunately. That was burnt up on 41st Avenue, but unfortunately I was stopped as a black male and falsely identified as a light-skinned Hispanic male. And when I tried to ask uh, why this incident occurred. Uh, the officer told me to just shut up. And so I think incidents like that and also and other incidents that I've heard as a black male with other black residents around Santa Cruz County uh, when it relates to policing, 
um, is deeply concerning as well. It's because um, definitely a lot of folks who black black individuals who commute around Santa Cruz County have this deep systemic fear of commuting past Capitola or through Capitola due to the hyper police presence and hyper uh, hyper uh, tension when it comes to dealing with policing, particularly Capitola PD. And so while I do respect the tradition of honoring those who have been good officers and honoring their you know, memories and honoring who they are, but also due to the systemic uh, hostile climate that we're dealing with right now, I think it's not in the best interest to display the flag given the recent incidents around Santa Cruz County and also around the Black Lives Matter mural being defaced. And um, hopefully, um, I'm hoping that maybe uh, hopefully in the future police can work with uh, organizers such as myself and other black leaders around the county to establish this more building and trusting relationship because I feel at this point in time uh, the relationship is very rocky and also there's a deep systemic fear as black residents as they commute through Capitola. So I just wanted to express that and thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ritchie. Does any other members of the public wish to address the council on this matter? Mayor Story, I do not see, let's see, oh, I do not see any other hands raised from attendees. And in, any, e any emails come in, Mayor? Uh, I do not see any emails on this type topic. Okay. All right, so, um, yeah, I kind of paused to see if there was anyone else that wished to speak on this uh, matter. Uh, but seeing none, I'm going to bring this now back to the council uh, for deliberation um, and action. Um, is there a council member that would like to um, lead us in this discussion? Um, I see Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thank you. Um, so, I will totally agree that I, I do feel like this is a controversial issue and um, I don't want it to become a personal thing. Um, I think that uh, I personally support our capital of PD. I rely on them. I trust them implicitly and have called on them many of times and they've shown up day and day. And in that same regard, I appreciate what uh, Chief Daly has come forth with and what the um, Safety Foundation has decided on in their own vote as well. Uh, I, my, my vote does not have anything to do with where the flag is displayed or who displays it, um, whether it was at the Capitol riots or anything like that. It is about our city personally. Um, anybody can fly the flag who wants to. Um, I, I think that our PD, if they choose to, should have stickers, have flags, what have you. Um, but I do feel like me personally, uh, thinking about our city, I just don't think that it has a place here. Um, and I would love to represent our PD in a, in a different way that is less uh, triggering or less divisive if that's possible, um, if, you know, if we could decide on a different, uh, maybe different type of federal flag or something that does hold the same weight, um, that's how I feel. And um, thank you for listening. And I'm uh, open to hear other council members' ideas as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Uh, council Member Bertrand. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, first of all, I want to thank the member of the public who spoke uh, earlier. And, um, you know, this is part of the democracy. People, you know, have ideas and they can bring it to the city council. And um, if we put it on the agenda, then it gets addressed. And we appreciate that. And um, the individual has also been, I think most of us know, very active member of the community, been on some various committees, uh, official committees and such. So, you know, this is an individual who put a lot of thought into this and I'd like to recommend, um, excuse me, I'd like to recognize that. Um, initially, um, I was sort of not wanting to do it and then wanting to do it. <laughs> and, you know, I went back and forth and 
the main fulcrum point for me was, uh, what do the police feel about it? Because just like our vice mayor said, um, we do recognize the role of police in our city. We have a lot of respect for the job they do. But uh, one caller sort of gives us a little brief view on maybe there's other views here too. So you, you, you have to wonder how, how do we deal with the subject that to some degree uh, could stir up a bit of controversy that maybe we're not ready to deal with. But when the police, uh, the POA decided to, to be um, abstain, I guess, from a vote on this, and then after I talked with the uh, police chief, you know, who put a lot of thought into this, uh, went for way beyond what I had thought about it. So I appreciate his analysis. And so I sort of would like to go that way and support the police department and the fact that they would like to be on stating in their position on this. To me, also, I like to have individual relationships with the various police that I know in this city. I've done ride-alongs. I, I feel comfortable talking with all of them. And, you know, I think, in a way, us as city council people, I think that um, that tells them that we do respect them as part of our city. If, if we reach out to the individual police and uh, have conversations, share uh, what we feel about things, um, listen to what they feel about the city. I think that's the way I've been showing the police in the city how I appreciate them. And uh, to the ones I have had that privilege of those conversations, I think they realize that I do appreciate them. And I don't need to put a flag up to indicate that. So um, I don't think I'm going to vote for this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Um, Call on Council Member Peterson at this time. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, thank you, uh, staff, and, and for preparing this report. And uh, thank you for uh, the public comments that we received on this. I want to take a moment first, um, as, as one of the, the first uh, person to make public comments suggested that he would hope that there were leaders who would stand up in their support for police. I, I first want to take a moment to share my family history in law enforcement. My grandfather worked for Capitola Police Department for 30 years, during which time he launched the D.A.R.E. program and the Safe Ride Home program, and served on the Santa Cruz County Mounted Sheriff's Posse, where he did search and rescue efforts, and later worked as a detective in the Santa Cruz County Coroner's Office after retiring from Capitola PD. He passed away in 2012 due to cancer, but since that time, as PJ mentioned, the City of Capitola has had the Herb Roth Law Enforcement Officer of the Year Award, which is named for my grandfather. When he passed, the Santa Cruz County Fallen Officer Foundation was extremely gracious in their support of my family, and I've since attended their fundraisers for several years in a row. Along with my grandfather, his son, my uncle, and several of my great uncles have also served in law enforcement. Back when my grandfather worked for Capitola PD, there was another officer, uh, Samuel Murray, who worked for Capitola PD that we knew as Uncle Sam, so despite the fact that he wasn't actually related to us. Um, we stay in touch with his family still. Others in my family uh, are retired or still active, one now teaching new officers at a police academy. And along with police, there are several military service members, firefighters, medical providers, and other first responders in my family. I respect them for all of their service in the face of all sorts of danger. They have always taught me that law enforcement and others that work in the community should, should be held to the utmost of standards above all uh, in, in setting a good example. And I have so much respect for our Capitola PD in particular for their exemplary service and the example that they set in our community. <laughs> oh, apologies. Uh, I believe in supporting our law enforcement. My dog has a lot to say about this as well. I believe in supporting our law enforcement and certainly currently sit on the county's Criminal Justice Council and previously sat on the Public Safety and Community Service Foundation Board, where I work to fundraise and organize their classic car show, national night out, golf tournament, and other activities in support of our police. I strive to support and promote causes in a way that encourage others to join. And while that is not always possible, I certainly take all measure, measures to try to make it so. I would hope 
that the original intent of the thin blue line flag was a good faith effort to show support for our law enforcement. And I find it unfortunate that it has been appropriated by, by white nationalist groups and, and others against the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but that being said, because it has been inappropriately lined with groups and causes that seek to divide and alienate those in our community, I find it difficult to believe that flying this flag would encourage others to join us in our support of the police as much as it would cause them to further withdraw from such support. And ultimately, I feel that displaying this particular flag would make the jobs of our, our police department harder and not easier. I've continued to research additional methods to provide uh, visible public support, and I hope that a compromise can eventually be reached that will allow us to meet our common goal of supporting police in a way that encourages others to feel invited to do the same. If, in fact, the main goal of this uh, proposal is physical, visible public support for our police, there's more than one way to accomplish that. And I'd like to encourage our city staff to use our social media newsletters and other means of public communication and outreach to share the support of our police department during the National Police Week. With all of that being said, um, I am not prepared to support uh, the presentation of this particular flag and I am prepared to support the staff recommendation to deny the request. Now, second. Was that a motion, uh, Council Member Peterson? Sure. Yes, and that was seconded by Council Member Brooks. So we have a, um, a motion and it's uh, on the table. Um, did you want to speak to that motion, uh, Council Member Brooks? Um, you know, I'll just say a couple of words. Um, it is really my honor and a privilege to sit next to all of you who are true leaders in our community. And I'm talking about our council members here who have su who support our police. And I see the work that we do, and I know what we do to support them. Um, so I just wanted to make that statement that I am really proud of the work we've done. The last, my last year as mayor, I worked incredibly hard on on working through one of the worst years I've seen or have have been part of in the of violence against. Um, against uh, people in our community, and um, it really triggered a lot of change in our community. And I'm so proud of the work we've done and how far we've come as a council and a community um, together in light of all of those things. And so I really appreciate Tyree speaking up today and being here to reflect on, on, on his experiences and that we still have a lot of work ahead of us. So I am honored to be to have seconded that motion with uh, Council Member Peterson because what she said is true. We value our police. This is not a matter of that. Unfortunately, this flag is not inclusive and does not allow for all people to feel welcome. And so um, I again appreciate all of uh, all of our police officers and what they do, and um, and thank all of you for your courage and in, in moving forward in in your leadership tonight. All right, thank you, uh, Council Member Brooks. Um, before I call for a roll call vote um, on the motion, um, I think, um, I mean, all of you have been very eloquent um, you know, uh, on, the, on the matter. Um, I'll try not to repeat uh, things that have already been said, but um, I wanted to, one, um, thank TJ um, and I also want to thank um, Mr. Ritchie uh, for bringing forth to us uh, kind of the two sides of, um, of this issue. Um, and um, as we have, have had to deal with in our society. Um, and, and I, and I, because what I hear from both of them is a, an appreciation of our police force. Um, and that the purpose of TJ bringing forth this request was to um, show support uh, with the police department. Um, and um, however, um, I'm not convinced that this is the way to show that support or the only way to show that support. Um, you know, particularly when, um, you know, we have not heard from the POA uh, about 
what they feel that they would need to feel support. Because, I mean, we can sit here all night and say how we support the police, but unless we're actually responding uh, to their articulated uh, needs and requests, um, then, um, you know, it's, um, you know, really um, difficult to do. Um, and at the same time, we have the chief of police, which is the leader uh, of our police department, recommending against displaying this particular flag. Um, and in my view, the best way that we can uh, uh, show support for the police is to respect uh, and support uh, the recommendations of the leader. Because I, I suspect that, and, and as he articulated, um, the reasons why are because this goes against our policy of community policing. And, um, you know, we need to be, um, you know, reaching out to all members of the community um, and um, letting them know that, um, you know, we uh, are inclusive and we treat everybody fairly. Um, and I just wanted to um, also recognize the distinction between um, flying this particular flag um, and the uh, pride flag, uh, because that has been kind of thrown out in juxtaposition. Um, if you did one, why not do the other? Um, and I just want to recognize, I mean, because to me it's the issue of community policing. Um, this flag and this symbol, uh, the pride flag and the symbol does not represent any particular department of our local government and particularly the police department, whereas this flag is meant to represent um, the police department who are um, here to enforce the laws and ordinances of our community. Um, and so to me, that's a major distinction between flying the pride flag and flying uh, the thin blue line flag uh, by the police department. Um, I don't think it's in keeping with our goals of community uh, policing. Um, and, and so, and, and I think that all that um, has been reflected by the discussions that I've heard at various levels. Um, we know it's a, it, it, the entire topic is the visit. So I think that the best way that we can maybe stop this division, but at the same time, continue I mean, to show support for our police department. And, and at every instance where if they may be disrespected um, or uh, not you know, uh, treated fairly, we should stand up um, and, um, and, and refute that and counter that uh, in every way we can. Um, and so, and, and I, I would say a better way to support our local police department is for everyone to um, sign up for the POA mail list and, and make a donation uh, to the POA. Um, and um, so, and also to speak on the, um, if I may, on the flag uh, code, um, I, I will say I agree with TJ that this particular thin blue line flag is not a violation of the flag code um, because technically it is not a United States flag um, and therefore uh, doesn't run afoul of the U.S. statute concerning uh, the flag code. Um, so with that, um, well, I, I would like, I mean, I would also um, hope that we could um, come back or maybe even um, agree on a different flag. I mean, the staff has recommended the in memoriam flag, uh, which is the uh, you know official flag of the National Association, uh, uh, or excuse me, the National Law Enforcement uh, Officers Memorial Fund. Um, and um, that may be an acceptable alternative to uh, the thin blue line uh, flag. Um, so with that, I'll um, ask Chloe to um, conduct a roll call vote. Yes. Councilman Chloe Hall. 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 Yes. Councilman Ch
Council Member Bertrand. I agree with the staff recommendation. Okay, perhaps, yeah, perhaps I should clarify the motion and the second is is for staff recommendation yeah. to deny the request. Okay. Yeah, so thank I'll, you. I'll call for the vote again. Thank you. Council Member Bertrand. Um, so I, I agree with the staff recommendation. Thank you. So I vote aye. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. That motion passes unanimously, and that motion is to uh, deny the flag request. Um, so with that, um, we'll move on to the next item this evening, which is item 8B, which is the eviction moratorium and housing is key funding. The recommended action is to receive a report and direct staff to repurpose remaining $105,000 in CDBG CD funds toward rental assistance. Um, Katie, you're going to present to us on this item? Yes. Good evening, Mayor Story, and good evening, Council. First, I'd like to check with Larry and make sure you, you can hear me okay and that my presentation is visible. All is good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this evening, I'm going to present an update as requested um, on eviction moratorium and housing is key funding. So I'm going to first go over a, a brief history on this matter. So back in March, on March 16, 2020, Governor Newsom signed Executive Order N2820, which permitted local governments to enact eviction moratoriums to protect tenants from eviction for non-payment of rent through May of 20, May of 2020. Um, in September, on September 30th, 2020, uh, this the residential eviction protections were extended, but also included at that time was that the state restricted the powers of local government to impose prohibitions on evictions. Um, and then there were additional extensions through March 31st, 2020. So I just really want to um, stress that our power to extend the uh, eviction moratorium went away the, on September 30th, 2020, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so in response to that, there's, a, there's been a, a lot going on over the past couple of weeks on, and the, on regarding the Housing is Key Rental Assistance Program. So the Rental Assistance, um, Housing is Key Rental Assistance Program, the highlights of uh, the application, this um, went into effect just a little over a year ago and it would cover up to 100% of unpaid rent and utilities for qualifying households. It's a state program. The state took away the ability for local governments to do their own rental assistance. Um, so it would cover 100% of unpaid rent and utilities. And then to qualify, residents have to, be, have to have fallen behind on their rent due to COVID-19. And they also have to qualify in terms of income levels. And they must be... Um, below 80% of the area median income, but they're giving priority to those households that are very low income and that's uh, below 30% of AMI. Um, the goals remain the same. The goal is to fund all active applications. The HCD is, currently has requests into the Treasury Department for more funding. And then um, a notice went out last week informing the cities that we can only, the, um, the rental assistance program is closing on the uh, on March 31st, and that cities may only fund rental assistance beyond March 31st, 2022. So from April 1st forward. Um, next, I'm going to give you an update on what the statistics are for the county and um, Capitola. But just really want you to uh, understand that if we were to do a rental assistance program, we could not go back for the past two years. It's only forward from May 1st uh, forward because there's at the state level, there's always the concern of duplication of benefits of one household getting their rent paid 
twice by two different entities. So, um, so within the county of Santa Cruz, these numbers have changed slightly since my staff report was published. Um, over the past week, I think I've had um, been involved in um, a half dozen meetings on this topic because it's quickly changing and there's a lot of concern out there. So County of Santa Cruz, the total applicants that came in through the state program was 3,407. Households served um, is 1,400. And pending applications, just shy of 2,000 households. The average assistance is a little above 10,000 for each household. So in the initial applications, the county received $55 million in requests for funding. The funding allocated has increased over time. At this point, there's $34 million that have been allocated to our county. Um, the funds from that allocation that have been paid out, $16 million. So there is remaining funds within um, the county at this time of $18 million, and those will be going out to applicants. Um, so where, how, does, how does the city of Capitola um, fall into these numbers? So Capitola, we had 113 applicants. The households that have been served at this time is 50. Um, we have pending applications for 63 households. And our average assistance is a little bit higher than what we saw countywide at 14,000. Um, so the 63 households that are pending, they fall into three categories. There's 26 of those um, are in this bucket of irregularity review. And that means when their application was being reviewed, there was something wrong with the application that just um, in the review, there were questions of could, um, there was a possibility of the household, like two households doubling up or um, having the same address, but maybe different unit numbers, they have to do further investigation, um, potential fraud, and then the items within this uh, bucket, they may be denied by the state at this point because um, there's just there's something that's not adding up within the applications. Not saying that they all will be denied, but they're reviewing those cases. The 34 case manager review outreach these are under review by the state, and there's something in the application that's uh, missing information, either from the tenant or the landlord. And there's also the possibility um, that the applicant has moved and is no longer following up on the emails that are sent to them or in contact with the state program. So once the outstanding information is received, these 34 case manager review outreach cases if, if they get the information that they're waiting for, the case will move forward in the system. Um, there's also three of those 63, which are now moving ahead. Um, so they, those were probably case manager review. They got the information they needed and now they're moving ahead. Um, so this week, there have been multiple meetings with the County of Santa Cruz and also the other cities within our county. Um, the county has announced a half a million dollars for case management legal services. This will be um, case management working with applicants who are awaiting funding and helping them get through the process in order to get kind of higher on the list of the state and hopefully funding um, as soon as possible. Um, the county is also, the services that they're providing within the, with this half million dollars will be available to Capitola residents so they can um, reach out to the county and will be able to utilize these services. And then the, we as city, as the city are continuing to work with the county on next steps. And I had mentioned that we have the ability to look at rental assistance beyond um, starting April 1st, 2022. And in discussions with the county and our city partners, um, we really want to, if, if we head down that path, make sure that it's meaningful follow-up support after April 1st, because we've uh, two years after the pandemic, we're at a point that our economy has opened up, there are jobs available, and just really making sure that any rental assistance that we do provide um, is meaningful and supportive for our residents. Um, so for our next steps as the city, we will inform residents of the county's strategies and resources. 
to minimize uh, formal evictions. Um, we'll also be tracking the state rental assistance program until final allocation funds are depleted to see hopefully our numbers increase of those households that are funded. And then we also have some money in our um, CDBG CARES Act funds, um, $105,000 um, for un that we can consider for unfunded households once the state program ends. So we really want to see where the state program is going. As I said, they haven't even made it halfway through the funding that's been allocated for the County of Santa Cruz. Once we see that that money has been allocated, um, we'd like to further the discussion of how to utilize the $105,000 of CDBG CARES Act funds. Um, tonight, my recommendation has been modified slightly since my staff report um, due to the new information that's been coming up in these meetings. So um, we're recommending that you direct staff to track the Housing is Key program and work with the county to coordinate on eviction protection and prevention to return to the city council for a discussion on repurposing the remaining $105,000 in CDBG CB funds once we have more information. And then also in response to the eviction moratorium, authorizing the mayor to send a letter of support to the state to extend the eviction moratorium to residents with active housing is key applications. So with that, I'm available for any questions. Council member Bertrand. You're on you're still on mute, Council Member Bertrand. I think I keep getting put off mute. <laughs> but anyway, um so I was just thank you, Katie, for the presentation. I appreciate it. It um answered some of my questions about why there's difficulties in moving forward being that we lost our control to extend uh, programs in this regard. So that clears that up. And um, I also appreciate that uh, uh, monies, uh, CBG grant monies have been uh, found and maybe we could um, figure out how to use those best to um, help people in the city. So I appreciate that, that that's great. Um, so my question is, it seems like there's some management difficulties here in terms of trying to make sure that the people getting the money still need the money and that the whole thing also, that's one point, and also the idea that some of these grants aren't going forward because of a variety of issues. And, and that's concerning for me. And um, so in regards to the second point, do, do we have adequate staff report or is it just because, like you said, there's attempts to reach the individuals and you know there's only so much you can do if they don't respond. Can you characterize what's going on in, in that, that second point of mine? Sure, uh -huh. so we've been hearing um, from our regional partners that there really has been a disconnect um, between the administration with the administration of this grant of these funds so um, the the half a million dollars that is um, that the county is going to be providing is specific to administrative funds to actually to help with these case management one-on-one -on -one in getting these applications through and also um, accountability and making sure that we're getting better reporting from the state of the applications as they go through the system. So that really, you, you've uh, hit the nail on the head. It is an administrative problem that um, with additional resources for our community, um, for our local nonprofits, it'll really help us strengthen our um, ability to get these cases through the state process. Thank you. Okay, and um, if we, figure out a way to handle our CBDG funds, will this be through the city's efforts or are we gonna to have to dovetail with that administrative process that may or may not be functional to our liking? So any CDBG funds that we utilize will have to benefit Capitola residents and they will have to have a tie back to impacts from, from the pandemic. 
So um, I wasn't, I'm not prepared to give you a recommendation yet on what we think is the most okay. beneficial way in which to help our residents until we get more information. But the money will go towards our residents and be tied to the pandemic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions from other council members? Seeing none. Um, Katie, I did have a question about um, part of your presentation was that the county was um, developing strategies to minimize eviction. Um, what are some of those strategies and, and that we would be basically working with them in that endeavor? Yeah, so they're really, they're putting together, um, they're strengthening their administrative teams and working with local nonprofits, um, Community Bridges, uh, CAB, and, and, there, and some legal assistance. There's different nonprofits that have been helping, um, that have been helping to get applicants through the system, but also bringing in legal aid so to work on mediation rather than evictions in the courts, so really um, strengthening our admin um, abilities to help, you know, individual households case by case. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any other, seeing no other questions from council members, I will um, see if members of the public would like to speak on this item. Um, if you would um, raise your um, hand in the Zoom application, or you can dial star nine, um, and you'll uh, be given three minutes to speak. You can also send an email to public comment at ci.capsola.ca.us. Um, Larry, it looks like we have one hand up. Yes, Mayor Stewart, we have Carlos. Yes, Carlos, and go ahead, please. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, 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 Capitola uh, Council members. Uh, uh, my name is uh, uh, Carlos. Um, I'm a COPA leader. And then uh, for the last couple of years, we've been uh, uh, organizing uh, webinars uh, by, in Zoom uh, to help uh, applicants, uh, I mean, tenants, uh, to, up, to get up, applic they can applic uh, uh apply to the program uh, Houses Ski. Um, so the total um, uh, numbers is uh, like 2,000 uh, families um, with help with uh, partnering with uh, uh, community bridges and, uh, and CAP. Um, and uh, we trying to ask you if you willing to provide legal service services uh, to these families to uh, help him get evicted. Um, and then because they're still waiting for um, the funds, uh, they can get paid uh, their uh, rent. Uh, we've been hearing some stories from families that they already, um, they have been uh, trouble to find uh, apartments or housing because uh, that's a lot of um, um, they ask they're asking for um, a lot of uh, money for for their deposit and uh, in a Copa uh, a Copa uh, recommends you if you consider it using funds for security deposits or people get evicted and um, thank you for offering sitting uh, city funds to help these uh, families. They, uh, this is going to be sad after the March 31st, seeing families living in their cars with the child, you know. Uh, those uh, stories uh, that we, we're hearing in these meetings, uh, we meet, we meet uh, every Monday, 6.30, uh, but in Zoom, um, uh, COPA leaders, uh, local COPA leaders, and and then, and we invited all the uh, supervisors, and we in touch with them, and they know uh, that we're asking for help for these families. And thank you all. Uh, thank you for having me. 
Yeah, thank you, Carlos, um, for speaking up and for your work um, with COPA. Um, are there any other members of the family or like that, uh, of the public? Um, families are on my mind now. Um, that would uh, like to speak to the council. Mayor Story, I do not see any other attendees wishing to speak on this, and we have not received any emails. Emails. Okay, I will um, close out the, the public comment portion of, on this item, and I will uh, bring it back to the council members for uh, further deliberation and action. Council Member Bertrand. You know, I have a follow-up question of Katie because of what Carlos spoke about. Um, isn't it true our city has a, a program to help with um, security deposits and such? We do. Um, we have a, an emergency rental assistance program for um, when someone's had a change of circumstance and needs assistance with rental assistance, and we also have a security deposit program to assist. And, and so we've passed the budget to include enough funding for that, going back to what we normally need, I guess. Yeah, I think we've kept our budget at the same level, um, mm -hmm. but it's it's been sufficient for the past few years. So. Okay, maybe we should reach out to COPA. Um, okay, thanks. Um, I'm prepared to make a motion. If if uh, others have comments, I'll be glad to wait. I think if you have a motion prepared, uh, Councilmember Bertrand, you should go ahead and present it, and uh, let's see if we get a second. Okay, I didn't memorize the uh, the foil that you put up, Katie. <laughs> yeah, you want to put up your. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'd like to move the um, following three items: staff recommendations. One, track the housing is key program and work with county to coordinate an eviction protection prevention. Number two, return to city council for a discussion on repurposing the remaining 105,000 in CBDG CV funds once staff has more information. And three, authorize the mayor to send a layer of support to the state to extend the eviction moratorium to residents with active housing is key application. That's my motion. There's a second. I can second that. Okay, there's a um, second by, um, I believe that was Vice Mayor Kaiser. Um, thank you. Um, so um, is there further discussion on the motion? Um, I, I did want to ask Katie, um, Carlos uh, asked uh, part of his presentation, he asked if we would agree with that. Uh, could um, provide legal services, but um, you know the first part of that motion, working with the county, the county is going to coordinate the provision of legal services to potentially um, evicted um, renters. Is that correct? That is correct. The county is providing those services with the half a million dollars. If there's a need there for more funding, it's something I could bring back to you. Um, regarding CDBG funds, but okay. we do want to learn more first. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Bertrand, did you have your um, hand up again for another comment? Yes, Mayor. Um, so as you know, I'm on the Senior Advisory Board, uh, part of the Senior Council in Santa Cruz, San Benito counties. And part of the pro one of the programs is to provide legal assistance in terms of um, what Carlos talked about, um, evictions, uh, rent negotiations, and a whole variety of things. Uh, it's a small group, but that's what they're uh, tasked to do. So that's through the senior services. Um, he may not know about because it's, uh, it's generally uh, addressing senior issues, but it's basically for anyone. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, um, uh, Chloe, can we have a roll call vote? Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. 
Hi. The motion passes unanimously, um, which will bring us to um, item um, 8C, which is to discuss possibilities for returning to in-person city council meetings. The recommended action is to provide directions to staff regarding city council, along with the planning commission and all advisory bodies, conducting virtual, in-person, or hybrid meetings. So we begin with a staff presentation. That's, all right. Thank Go you. ahead, Chloe. Thank you, uh, Mayor Story. One moment. I'll get situated. Moderator Larry, are we seeing everything? Yes, Chloe, it works fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor and Council. I am going to be presenting different options on how to conduct City Council meetings moving forward. And we'll start with a very uh, brief, quick overview of kind of the status of COVID-19 at this moment. As you're all aware, things change very quickly. So this is not meant to be the end all be all report, just kind of a check in where we are now. Um, in Santa Cruz County, the current case rate is a little above 12 per 100,000, which is slightly higher than the average throughout the state. Uh, as you are probably seeing in the news, uh, a sub variant of Omicron has been identified. The United Kingdom uh, has experienced a secondary surge, secondary to the original Omicron surge that we did see here. Uh, so far in New York, there has been a 26% increase over the last couple weeks in case counts, but it doesn't seem that they're mirroring the exponential growth that was seen in the United Kingdom. So honestly, I don't know to say if that's good news or not. I don't, we don't know everything, but that's the situation as it is. Uh, some good news here about um, our very local case counts. You'll see from March 20th to 24th, our um, active cases did go down. Um, so we're currently at 546 here in the county. So that's an overview because of course, the reason we are holding virtual meetings is because of the pandemic. So a little background, uh, you may remember early in the pandemic, an executive order from the governor is what allowed us to have these virtual meetings. Uh, now we are doing so under Assembly Bill 361. I mention it at the start of every meeting and uh, that does allow um, cities to hold virtual meetings and it amends the Brown Act as long as certain things have taken place. Uh, two of those is council adopting findings every 30 days and that there is still a governor declared state of emergency in place. So you also may have um, been hearing uh, near the end of last year, there was a different assembly bill 339 that requires large cities to allow for remote public attendance during in-person public meetings. However, just be aware, uh, the city of Capitola is not subject to that bill. Uh, we are much, much below um, the size requirement. So it's background. Uh, and I just wanna say, I recognize that some of this may be confusing and we've tried to make it as clear as possible. So if you have questions, please let me know and I'll do what I can to be clear. Uh, this is kind of laying out the basic three options for council to attend meetings moving forward. So first, virtual attendance, much as you're doing now, uh, exactly identical as, as what, we're, what we're doing currently. The hybrid option would be some council remote using Zoom and some in person. That would be the same as with the public, in person and virtual. And then the third option, coming back in person, all of council here in chambers, I wouldn't be all alone. Uh, and that is, that is possible now based on orders and rules and maybe some safety precautions based on COVID. So those are the three kind of frameworks we're gonna be talking about. Another layer to consider, um, although not required, uh, that the size is 250,000 to, to require remote public access to meetings. There are two different ways that staff has identified that council could direct us to allow for remote public testimony so that the public could be engaged and involved while not physically present. 
Uh, the first, which currently is, is a, available, is through email. Uh, the oral communications and public comments can be emailed in. This is possible regardless of having a hybrid or an in-person council meeting. It allows for public participation. And uh, as you've, we've been doing today, it's, it's fairly smooth. It's, it's not a problem for staff or for council to make that accommodation. For Zoom uh, remote public testimony, especially um, if there's a hybrid meeting and some people are here in person, some are participating over Zoom, there are some technology challenges at the moment. So keep that in mind and we'll, we're gonna actually discuss that in its own slide here. So technology considerations to think about, um, in particular, having Zoom for remote public testimony and for council participation, a hybrid meeting. In the short term, staff can make that happen. There would be someone operating a Zoom meeting and a standalone camera. The, the slight negative is that that would not create an integrated official community television broadcast. It would be a very different um, visual while watching at home on television than watching the Zoom or watching the live stream. So that could be a little clunky. However, the cost is, um, is easy to accommodate and staff could do that if we're so directed. In the longer term, integrating that broadcast and having an identified staff person to moderate the Zoom meeting and could be a contractor, the cost is really unknown. I know that some upgrades and other um, things would be necessary. So if that's something council is interested in pursuing, that will be a very different conversation. So, all of that being said, uh, if council is to return for in-person meetings, there are several common sense measures that we can take that, that are very, um, they're kind of not as time consuming and they're, they're easy to do, such as leaving the doors open, having airflow, recommending people wear masks when they're not speaking, uh, having the community room available as an overflow room for the public so that people are spread out. Those are things that we can absolutely do um, at any point when in person, if in person meetings are to resume. And other restrictions can also be considered if council wishes. That would be requiring masking, requiring vaccinations, or limiting the room occupancy for the meetings. So these are possible. It's up to council to decide if some of those may counteract the benefits of being in person or not. They are available to you. So this chart was in the staff report and is really kind of, I'm, I'm considering this a um, choose your own adventure buffet of options for how and when and if you wanna come back in person, remaining virtual, a hybrid, lots of different considerations here in this column and can be pretty much mixed and matched based on what council wishes to do. So I'm gonna leave that up and you know, you're more than welcome to discuss and share with staff what your desire is. And I'm available for questions and, and to help clarify if, if I can. So that is the presentation. Thank you so much. Other questions on Chloe's presentation? Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, Chloe, for for clarification, when I'm thinking about the hybrid model, um, in the previous slide, it said something about whether we would need CCTV or something like that, and we're just not sure what that would look like or what the cost is. Is that correct? Can you tell me, I'm just trying to remember, the, the CCTV is so that it can play live on our social media and like on the TV. I'm just trying to remember what it's for. It's been so long. I'm not remembering what it's exactly all for. I understand. Um, in, in terms of what we need, what do we need to be a successful hybrid model um, is my question. Sure, so I can respond briefly and then if our moderator wants to jump in, I welcome him to do that because he's our technology uh, genius. But I would say, yes, community television is, there's someone physically here and he's, controlling what is shown on community television so that people at home can watch the meeting live. Currently, because we're using Zoom, the visual that's being streamed online through YouTube and on our website is actually the Zoom meeting, and that is what Larry, um, our moderator, is controlling. So 
if we're doing both and there's more people than just me here in the room, it gets messy and there's sound quality issues. It can, it can work, but longer term, I think there's some technology requirements so that CCTV would be pushing things out um, virtually. And I'm gonna stop speaking because I don't wanna say anything wrong <laughs> about that. No, that actually makes complete sense. We're we're not quite there yet. We need it. And and the, the other cities in our county are doing are utilizing this kind of hybrid model with all of this new technology from what I understand. Is that accurate? I believe the county's doing it and Watsonville's doing it as well. So my understanding So we have someone to lean on a little bit. Yes, Watsonville is going through renovations and is on their way there they haven't debuted that yet but they they certainly have gone through the motions of figuring that out and i believe there are other organizations as well that we could communicate with and just as a rem uh, reminder to myself i believe this was one of the um goals that we were talking about earlier on or maybe it was mayor's story who, whose goals was to bring us back at least in person um within within reason but we didn't set a budget right um in terms of putting money towards this yet have we correct i believe that would if if desired that would be part of the budget workshops that are coming up um i believe starting in may okay and my last question is do we have any idea on how long something like that could take to set up that I'm going to lean on our moderator for the answer. Yes. Mayor Story, uh, Councilmember Brooks. Um, so we've actually uh, started that process. Um, it was part of a, a, uh, the mid-year. We added some funding from PEG to upgrade the city council chambers, and that includes cameras as well as the infrastructure to, to kind of do this, what we're doing, streaming live. Unfortunately, we are running into some supply issues. Um, it is, we, I don't have a solid date, but the equipment's been ordered. Um, and as soon as it's ordered, they're gonna come in and do the installation. That technology will allow us to kind of, what we're talking about, kind of integrate both the Zoom as well as the in-person meeting into kind of one frame um, for people to see as well as participate in. Um, the bigger thing I think, um, Chloe mentioned is that we have to figure out how we're going to moderate that meeting that when we get to that point. The technology, it, you know, we've, we've, we've confirmed that it has those capabilities um, built in, um, but, you know, once we move forward, the budgeting may end up being mainly for um, either have community television, who does do this for other agencies, to moderate these meetings or to have a staff person moderate it so that way we can make sure that the people you know in in the hybrid mode you know get a very similar experience to the meeting that the people in, in person do because right now as i think what chloe pointed out if we were to just kind of come in with a camera it would be a very different experience for those folks but um okay so we don't know how long it could take th to at this point get you know, going. He, he said he the the, the I pinged out a couple times to the the uh the the, the company and they're looking they're hoping the end of may to get the equipment in and then it's then it's okay. a couple it's a, it's not a very long install they'll be able to get it installed pretty quickly but of course you know that's they don't have a they don't have a fixed date okay um i i'm sorry i there is one more question that comes to mind when we when we use the term hybrid are we envisioning hybrid um we that's for the audience to participate but are we talking about council members as well i've seen like the county has some supervisors in person and there's like a trade-off. I'm not sure that staff has really gotten in into the weeds, but when you use that term, are you also including council members in that model or suggesting so? Yes, and I just would add that remains the case and, and possible as long as we're following AB 361. So we're not prohibited from allowing remote hybrid participation of the public However, when it comes to council, we do need to have other things in place, like adopting the resolution with the findings every 30 days and having the governor emergency de state of emergency declared. So, so as long as that's happening, which seems to be the case, then yes, 
hybrid for, for all. Okay, those are all my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. Um, any other council members have questions? Let's see, and then, um, oh yeah, I had a question about, in the written staff report, um, it makes reference to whether we would want to set some sort of trigger metric as to, uh, based on COVID case counts, when we would come back. Um, and I was just, um, since we've been following pretty much the county public health directives, um, could we, moving forward, just continue to use that? Um, and as long as they don't mandate, um, you know, in, in, indoor gatherings um, um, in terms of mandatory masks or mandatory uh, vaccination, um, could we just um, rely on the, the county health to uh, guide our implementation? Yes, I, I'm going to clarify my understanding of what you've asked. Um, absolutely, we would be following county health regarding if council were to return in person and we were to, to have public here, the types of um, recommendations regarding having the doors open and, and recommending masks and then those um, pieces of your question regarding the metric to trigger returning i think that would be something council would establish uh my understanding is there's no um you're not prohibited from returning now based on anything from county health does that answer your question yeah i i i believe so and i'm, I'm just responding to page the top of page 64 in the written staff report where it's that suggests or says one option is that we may want to establish our own case rate met metric. Um, and I was just, I guess what I was posing, uh, could we just continue to rely on the county public health instead of trying to, um, you know, become uh, versed on, um, you know, the, the public health um, uh, question and, um, and, um, and, 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 and trying to set particular numbers um, ourselves and just rely on the, the county, um, you know, direction. We certainly can rely on the county direction. I, I would be surprised at this point if the county came out with new restrictions on indoor gatherings. They didn't implement any in, uh, restrictions on indoor gatherings during the Omicron surge. So, um, Certainly relying on the county, if there was a county restriction on indoor gatherings, we would follow it. Um, the option to create a metric was simply to put it out there. If council didn't want to pick a fixed date, maybe pick a certain case target, but that's completely at your discretion. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, any other, um, let's see, council questions? I'm seeing none. Um, I'll ask if members of the public at this time um, would like to join us over Zoom and uh, contribute to this uh, discussion. You notice any emails, Larry? Uh, Mayor Story, I don't see any attendees and um, we have not received any emails on this topic. Okay, well, I'll bring it back uh, to the body um, for further discussion and um, being the will of the council. Anybody like to speak on the matter? Yes. Or does nobody want to come back? Um, uh, council member uh, Burke. <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, I would have said, yeah, let, you know, things were looking well and there wasn't talk of a new variant and I felt really confident and um, and I think that just is a reflection of our times. There's moments where I feel confident and that it's a safe place for people to gather and for us to all be together again and then something else happens. Um, and so under, I, I actually am really happy that the governor put into place this, um, this allowance through 2024. Um, I really appreciate Mayor Story's intent of 
trying to bring us back and and building a system that allows us to do so. Um, all my questions earlier in regards to hybrid, um, I think are uh, were were because I was leaning towards going looking creating a space where we can return with a hybrid model. Um, I don't see that. It doesn't sound like that's going to happen in the next month or so. And and quite honestly, I'm I'm comfortable with that because of the talks with the new variant, the uncertainty, and still. Um, and there's also an element of inclusiveness. You know, there are some people who would like to participate, but are worried, or they have um, people who they might be worried about and don't want to be be out in in public yet. And so there's just a lot of different layers to this onion that I don't think we I've figured out. And so I don't really want to press or force um, anyone's hand in this. So I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on suggesting we add some more funding to getting chambers um, uh, updated so that we are prepared for a hybrid model in, in several months, perhaps um, in the summer. Um, it sounds like end of May, June, and then I think we're, we're not in session in June. I can't remember which month, but that might give us enough time. We'll be prepared to, to come back as a, in a hybrid model um, and then we can evaluate if that's actually a good idea or not, depending on the variant. So um, those are my thoughts and ideas is to um, put some more funding behind um, getting the technology updated to, to move in that direction. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Peterson. Thank you. I just want to support uh, what Council Member Brooks just said. I think I'm also concerned about um, returning fully at this time, but the idea of um, putting some funding behind updating our chambers to allow for hybrid meetings um, once we determine that we're ready for it, I think is a great idea. Um, and I'm wondering if um, if that's something that, I can't remember when our next budget discussion is going to be, and I don't know if staff can, can um, refresh my memory. We'll be releasing the budget in the beginning of May, and then we'll be kicking off budget hearings. So if you wanted us to look into the cost to set up the chambers for high quality hybrid meetings, uh, we could do that and then present those figures to you in the budget. Okay, thank you. Was that what you were suggesting, Council Member Brooks? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yes. I think that gives us time that allows us to be proactive. We're doing, we're, we're talking about coming back. Um, so I think we are, we're, we're doing it all that we can at this time. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, I think that's a smart way to move forward. So I just wanted to express um, my support for the comments that Councilwoman Brooks had made. Councilmember Bertrand. Well, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, uh, first off, uh, thank you for staff. Uh, as Larry said, um, they're planning to upgrade the equipment. So if any need arises and that potential, we'll be um, able to meet it. Um, even if we don't need uh, COVID protection, I think um, the ability to um, get people involved, you know, because they don't have to come to the meeting room. I think is well worth it. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to broaden our involvement in the city because of those kinds of technology advances. Um, pretty much what Councilwoman Brooks said, I, I agree with. Um, do things now so we're prepared. Um, but I have one other question and um, that, you know, I didn't hear anything about what staff feels about going hybrid and um, <clears throat> As far as I'm concerned, that, that's an individual uh, decision. If we're hybrid, staff doesn't want to come in, that's totally fine with me. If they do want to come in, that's totally fine with me also. But I don't feel whatever way we choose uh, that there's any pressure in any shape or form for staff to all show up in the back of the room. Um, I respect their individual uh, decisions in this regard. Um, as whether they feel it's it's proper for their family and themselves. So I just wanted to make that statement and 
Um, um, that's it. Thanks. And um, actually, um, Yvette, uh, I think what you said, you could, as far as I'm concerned, you could put that in the form of a motion. It looks pretty good to me, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Uh, I believe staff is just looking for uh, direction from us at this okay, time. Okay, direction. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'll go along with the, that's direction. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like we're maybe moving towards some sort of consensus um, on, on that direction. So, yeah. are there any other council members that have comments? And, and um, yes, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thank you. Yeah, I just kind of want to echo what Councilwoman Brooks said. Um, I do feel like while we're all probably kind of feeling more semblance of normalcy as we move forward, there is sort of that like looming factor of something else could happen. Um, I'm sure other people in the community as well, not just uh, staff or council will probably feel that too. Um, so I, I would love to see us uh, be inclusive and be able to move forward in a safe manner and then kind of inch our way towards m more of an in-person type of thing, but doing it in a timely fashion that is comfortable for everybody that's involved. Um, and, it, you know, for my side of it too, not to mention like the convenience factor, um, I don't know, maybe a lot of people are still working from home and things like that. I, however, do not. So it does provide me personally with a, a, a little bit more wiggle room within my schedule. And if I'm joining a meeting from home rather than going out into the public and doing something like that too. So just putting that out there. But I, I think if we can direct staff to make things more feasible moving forward technology-wise and something that works for all of us, that would be awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Vice Mayor Kazi. So, um, you know, I guess, I, you know, trying to sum up our direction to staff, it looks like we are asking that the staff research the cost of a, um, of of a fully integrated, uh, you know, Zoom and CTV um, um, hybrid meeting, uh, so to speak. Um, and also, um, uh, if you could provide us with a timeline on uh, uh, getting that installed, tested, and making sure it's run, because I think it's important that, that, you know, we have a quality presentation, you know, when we're up and running. Um, because I've seen in other meetings um, attempts to do um, kind of a hybrid meeting on a shoestring, and it just turned out to be a disaster. So I think we should uh, take the time to do it right, get that information. Um, that would also give us some time. And instead of maybe picking a hard date right now to, to go back, watch it a little bit um, longer. Um, and um, once we have all that information, um, we can then uh, pick a date of when we can go live in person because, you know, I, I think that that's gonna be the expectation and, um, and, and uh, you know, the, the mandate that we, uh, um, you know, be live in person. Um, now, it, you know, in terms of staff, I, just, I consider that a matter of the city manager's discretion um, and, and part of his role in managing his staff of how they um, may want to participate and so um, and um, and I don't you know uh, Jamie there may also need to be some policies and guidelines that we may need to uh, consider and um, you know uh, and implement uh, moving forward um, so to kind of help us um, with a framework to you know, make sure every, that everything runs smoothly um, and everybody has, um, you know, an opportunity to, to participate. So, did I, um, I see Councilmember Brooks' hand went up. So. Is, this, is this a good time to ask for new chairs as well? I'm just going to throw that out there for chambers. Since we're yeah, going to be updating I guess, chambers. I guess this is new uh, chairs. Put that into the technology budget. Um, 
of, there you uh, go. as part Bring of your own. <laughs> when, we, uh, when we actually do come back. Um, you know, I'm not kidding either. <laughs> oh, I, I know that. That's <laughs> I wanted to be sure to make it part of the, <laughs> part of the direction. Um, so, um, does anyone? Did I, I mean? I got, uh, does anyone have anything to add or want to correct? Um, you know, my kind of summation of where we may be at this time. Seeing none, I think um, we have. Direction, Jamie. You think you have adequate direction at this time to kind of move us forward? And I do, I do. We'll research the cost, do a high-quality hybrid meeting, uh, see the, what the technology, the timing of the technology that we've already gotten, and if we need other things, we'll identify the, those costs in the budget, and then we'll figure out a timeline for when it'll all be done, and we'll figure out how we go back. All right. Your point about the policies is a good one, actually. Uh, it's something I need to think a little bit about is. It could be new issues that we're going to want to confront ahead of time rather than dealing with them after the fact. Right. And, you know, I mean, some of these may just kind of come up. We may not be able to anticipate all of them, but as many as we can possibly try to get in front of, I, I think it will be helpful as we transition to a brave new world, to a brave yeah. old, old world. So, okay. Right. Any, anything else on this item? Um, Only going, I'm, and I believe I, I believe I did go out to the public on on this item um, already. So, um, so with that, that brings us to item nine, which is adjournment. Um, thank you for everyone. Thank, thank you, staff. Thank you, council, for um, you know conducting the city's business. Um, and as I always end, um, be sure to be kind to yourself and be kind to others. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Mm -hmm.